Our topic this afternoon is the Austrian theory of the business cycle. And uh, this is one of those things that uh, sometimes Austrians are accused of being uh, broken records or broken clocks. Uh, the uh, punchline has already been given away to you that this is started by artificial credit expansion. And so like these people say, like you Austrians, you're always saying that there's a recession around the corner. It's always coming up. And of course our response is, well, yeah, you keep on inflating. <laughs> you keep on <laughs> artificially increasing credit. So, it's the sort of thing that it's, uh, it's always in the news. It's always relevant. And I've got some more examples here of that. There's uh, uh, Janet Yellen is being very squishy about the definition of recession. They always want to avoid the bad press that's associated with that. So Yellen is saying a common definition of recession is two negative quarters of GDP growth. And then less than a minute later, she's saying, but even if we have that, even if we have two quarters of negative GDP growth, that's not a recession. So it seems very squishy. And then, of course, our uh, current Fed chair, Jerome Powell, uh, is saying that, uh, or at least uh, hoping to achieve this immaculate dis uh, disinflation, trying to achieve the soft landing with the increase in interest rates. And of course, while, while these things are, are being put out there in the media, we had the, the New York Fed posting uh, graphs that look like this, that based on the changes in the yield curve, they have a higher probability of recession based on this measure uh, than compared to in uh, 2008 and 2007. So there's, there's a, a lot of uh, conflicting stories being told. And so that's, that's one reason why it's, it's good to get a, a good understanding of what causes business cycles, uh, where they come from. So I hope you uh, noticed that the, the, <laughs> the week is structured in a very intentional sort of way. So we've, we've got the basics down. We've, we've already heard lectures from professors Herbener and Salerno and Patrick Newman and others about the operation of the market economy, about how we can economize our use of resources through the use of market prices and economic calculation. So we can arrange production in such a way that we, we anticipate to attain our, our most urgent desires in the future in the form of, uh, or with consumer goods. And, uh, and we've talked through the operations of this and how it works, and it's, it's very harmonious. In fact, uh, Professor Rittenauer said that it's beautiful, and, and indeed it is. So it's important to, to note here, uh, when we talk about business cycles, we're not talking about something that is inherent in the market economy. This is not something that is, is built in. This is something that happens as a result of an intervention. And so Austrians have a, a very deep and rich uh, theory of interventionism, uh, namely what happens when the government sticks its finger in, in the market economy and messes things up. So <clears throat> the, yeah, interventionism is all about what happens when voluntary actions and exchanges are prohibited or distorted or inhibited by, by the state. And so the business cycle theory fits in that category. Uh, it's uh, worth noting here that uh, business cycle theory is in that section of man, economy, and state. So in Murray Rothbard, first he set up the workings of the market economy, and then he talked about all the different uh, types of ways that the government can intervene, and the bus business cycles are, are in that section. So uh, Mises has this analogy um, that I, I find uh, very fruitful, it's very helpful uh, to, to understand what is happening in a business cycle. And it's based on uh, this master builder. It's, it's based on this guy who's, who's building a house. And, and I've taken the opportunity to illustrate this, this very short story that, uh, that uh, Mises, I didn't illustrate it myself, but I wrote a story that goes, that goes along with it and hired somebody to illustrate with uh, beautiful illustrations. But Mises' analogy goes like this. The whole entrepreneurial class is, as it were, in the position of a master builder whose task it is to erect a building out of a limited supply of building materials. If this man overestimates the quantity of the available supply, he drafts a plan for the execution of which the means at his disposal are not sufficient. He oversizes the groundwork and the foundations and only discovers later in the progress of the construction that he lacks the material needed for the completion of the structure. It is obvious that our master builder's fault is not overinvestment, but an inappropriate employment of the means at his disposal. So this is, this is not some hydraulic theory. This is not uh, uh, all of a sudden there's too much consumption, there's too much investment, all, the, all of a sudden uh, there's these uh, uh, misallocations of funds going in one direction versus another direction that, that needs to be corrected if we just tweak the right policy variables. 
uh, in the Austrian uh, understanding of business cycles, it's, it's real. It's based on specific capital goods being made that apply to certain lines of production that don't apply to different lines of production, and that uh, mistakes are made. It's not just too much of something. It's not just overinvestment. Um, in fact, there is no overinvestment. It's, uh, it's malinvestment. It's creating the wrong sorts of things. A similar analogy that I sometimes use is uh, with Crusoe. Obviously, we, all, we Austrians always go back to Crusoe. So Crusoe's alone on his island, and uh, he wakes up one morning, and uh, he notices some, some mushrooms growing outside of his, his little dwelling. And he consumes some of these mushrooms. And the effect of these mushrooms is that it causes him to hallucinate. It causes him to, to look at his supply of resources, maybe his, the supply of his uh, consumption goods, berries and coconuts that he's picked over time. And the nature of the hallucination is such that it causes him to, to perceive that they are 10 or 100 times more than actually exist. So there's way more saved resources than he actually has. And you can imagine that this observation it's a, it's a hallucination, but this observation would cause Crusoe to undertake different sorts of production projects. He would change the sorts of things that he produces. He, he, would, not, uh, he would not be building a rudimentary net to, to, for fishing, for example. He, he might see this huge uh, stock of consumption goods and think, I, since I have this large stock of consumption goods, I can embark on a very long production project. I can, I can start building myself a mansion and get rid of this shack that I have. So I, I can perhaps start building a cruise ship, depending on how big the, or how uh, erroneous the hallucinations are. And so uh, obviously over time, the, the effect of the mushrooms wears off and he realizes that his stock of state resources has actually dwindled it's gotten smaller because he's been consuming the coconuts and berries. He's been using up the, the, the uh, tools that he has D but while he's been pursuing these wrong lines of production, the lines of production that were started based on the hallucinations. So he realizes this, this mistake, and so he has to undo it. He has to fix the mistakes that he made during this, this, uh, this boom period, this artificial boom. Um, nevertheless, if you asked uh, Crusoe while he was hallucinating, uh, he would say, yeah, the, my economy is doing great. Yeah, there's lots of consumption, lots of, I've got lots of projects going on. It seems like everything is on the up and up. But of course, once he realizes the mistakes, he's, he, he realizes he's in a worse position than before. And so this is, this is just a sort of a silly way of describing what happens to the macro economy when uh, credit is artificially expanded. Okay, let's get some uh, definitions out of the way. Um, a lot of uh, discussion with students about business cycles will get into, will this cause a business cycle? Will this cause a business cycle? And so it's important to distinguish what, what we actually mean by a business cycle. And so one thing that we can rule out is we, we don't mean regular business fluctuations. We don't, we don't mean the, the way that the economy is constantly changing due to new data or the entrepreneurs are, are changing their anticipations of the future or consumers have changed their preferences, or a new fad comes by. So we can see uh, sectoral shifts. We can, we can see uh, differences between markets as, as these conditions change. But those are, those are just regular, everyday business fluctuations. We, Austrians have a theory for this. It's, just, it's the theory of entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurs had this function of anticipating future market conditions and consumer demands so they can arrange the factors of production today so that those consumer uh, demands are met, so that they can profit as a result of that. So we have a theory for that. When we talk about business cycle theory, we're talking about something different and bigger. OK, so that's, those are uh, business fluctuations. And entrepreneurs have the task of dealing with and anticipating these changes. What we mean by a business cycle, on the other hand, is a general boom in a general bust. And you can see the contours of this in the data. Uh, so uh, you don't really need to know exactly what this is, but this is the unemployment rate. Uh, my point is that you can see over uh, a long enough time span, you can see the, the general trends, the ups and downs. You can see the stock market go up and down. You can see uh, home price indices go up and down. You can see employment figures, income figures, consumption, investment figures, all these things. They have this, they have this wave-like feature to them. And that's, that's what we're trying to explain. That it's that observation of the general boom 
So economy-wide, applies to the entire economy, and economy-wide bust as well. That's what we're talking about. One thing that we notice in the data, speaking of data, is that in the bust phase, when things are going down, it, it appears that uh, capital good industries have wider, bigger fluctuations than consumer good industries. And you can see this it, with the, uh, the 2008 crisis and ensuing recession. You can see on the left, there's the a consumer price index versus the producer price index on the right-hand side. And you can, you can just sort of see this. You can use one of my uh, professors used to call eyeball metrics. You can just sort of see that, yeah, there's greater variation. There's more uh, fluctuation in, in the capital goods industries. So this is, this is one thing that Rothbard points out is something that our business cycle theory would have to explain, as well as the fact that it's a, a general boom and a general bust. Another thing that we have to explain is the cluster of entrepreneurial errors. So in the, at the beginning when I was talking about we're, the fact that we're not talking about business fluctuations, we already have a theory for that. It's just entrepreneurship, or we talk about how entrepreneurs anticipate the future. One thing that we notice in a business cycle, however, is that it appears that the mass of entrepreneurs, all of them, were making the same kind of mistake. So it seems like they were all making mistakes at the same time. And there's not really, uh, at least it's not um, immediately apparent that there was uh, something causing that, like they were, um, like there was some sort of mass psychosis, something exogenous that was changed. It turns out that there is, but we'll get to that in a second. So it, it appears that they're all making the same sorts of mistakes in the past, and we don't really have a, a, a reason apart from business cycle theory for what would be generating all of those errors, the cluster of errors to happen at the same time. So our business cycle theory has to take into account all of these things. So we have to have the, the stages or the, the boom followed by the bust. We have to have some sort of explanation of the cluster of entrepreneurial errors. And we also need to explain the more dramatic fluctuations in the capital goods industries as, as opposed to the consumer goods industries. Rothbard points out by the way, when I reference Rothbard, Rothbard here, I'm referring to uh, what I think is his most excellent um, overview of business cycle theory, which is in chapter one of America's Great Depression. So Rothbard says that we should look at money and credit as suspect areas. It seems like uh, these areas uh, have uh, far-reaching influences throughout the economy, and they have the potential for causing these sorts of um, observations. It seems like they, they might help us explain a cluster of errors if entrepreneurs are looking at interest rates, for example, or uh, why, why there might be big changes in capital goods industries if there's, a, if there's big changes in, in how production is, is being undertaken as a result of a change in interest rates. So, so we'll look at those areas as, as suspect areas. Okay, so now we're, get, we're getting closer to, to being able to explain the business cycle, but as Hayek mentioned, we should first figure out how, we, how things work correctly. So how, how is it that we get sustainable economic growth, and then we can contrast it with unsustainable economic growth or the, the boom-bust cycle? And so to get there, first we'll recap the last lecture very briefly, the structure of production, because that plays a major role here, and also a time preference and interest from, from this morning. Then we'll be able to explain where sustainable growth comes from, and then we can contrast it with unsustainable growth, as I said. And what we'll notice is that during the boom, what explains the, the necessity of the correction, the necessity of the, of the recession, is the fact that factors are, are malinvested. We have malinvestment, and also we have overconsumption. We have capital consumption going on during the, during the boom phase. And, so, and then we'll conclude after that. So instead of flourless chocolate cake, I use ham sandwiches. And uh, I, 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 I like flourless chocolate cake, but the example that I've chosen to use is a ham sandwich. So I want you to imagine with me the case of a, a deli producing a ham sandwich, and uh, we'll have to think through all of the prerequisites. What are the things that have to happen before the ham sandwich can appear? And in class, I'll usually go through this very slowly and ask them to, to offer these sorts of things. But since we're crunched for time and you just had this lecture, we can do it pretty quickly. But the first few things that we need to make a ham sandwich are ham, bread, lettuce, tomato, some condiments like mayo, uh, a plate, tables and chairs. But you also need the uh, natural resources and space. You need some labor to put it all together. And of course, this does not uh, exhaust 
the explanation of where ham sandwiches come from, because now we have to explain where these intermediate factors came from. The land and labor are originary factors, so we'll leave those as dead ends. But for the ham that comes from a butcher, the bread comes from a bakery, and all of these things have <coughs> structures of production behind them. And it, as you'll see, this, this gets very complex. A, a lot of things go into the construction of the capital goods uh, that end up making other capital goods that end up making other capital goods that make the ham sandwich. And as we get bigger and broader, you'll notice it sort of looks like a conspiracy theorist chart. <laughs> <laughs> Something that looks like this. And so Austrians have taken this very chaotic looking sort of <laughs> mess and we've, we've decided that it's, no, it's, not, uh, it's not tractable. It's not something that we can work with. And so instead of, instead of leaving it as this big network, this big mess, we've tried to make sense of it. And the way that we make sense of it is by considering two different dimensions. So we think about time, production time. So it takes time for us to, to start with natural resources and our own labor to make capital goods and then other capital goods, intermediate products along the way to making the consumption good. And another dimension is spending. So we can think about the, the prices and the quantities of these factors that have been purchased. And so if we go back to our original ham sandwich network here, we can rearrange all of this according to when it happens. So from left to right, because we're in Western civilization, we've got <laughs> stuff that was first, stuff that has to happen first with the mining of the uh, raw materials, the metals and everything, the, the trees that are cut down. And then we get the intermediate capital goods like the furniture, uh, manufacturers, the tools that are there, the refrigerator and the oven. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we have the, the uh, consumer good, the sandwich. You might uh, realize, if you turn your head sideways, that this looks a lot like uh, figure 32 in uh, Man, Economy, and State. So here we, it's just a description of how capital goods, land, and labor are combined through a process of production to make the final uh, consumption good. Okay, so this shows the time dimension, but what about the, the spending dimension? Well, it turns out if you just stack up the dollars that are spent in each one of these stages, conceptually we can think about it happening in stages, then we get a triangle-shaped figure that looks like this. And so this is your very typical, well-known Hayekian triangle, uh, for example, where the spending in the first stage is, is counted on the very left-hand side than the spending in the second stage. And one thing that we know, uh, that as, as our economy approaches uh, the evenly rotating economy, or the ERE for short, we know that the only remaining price spread between, these, between the factors in the stages is interest. So all profit goes to zero. There's no more uncertainty. All we have is time and uh, time preference. So, and, and in that case, there, there would still be this, this uh, disutility of waiting, and therefore there would be the the discounting of the factors earlier in the stages of production compared to the, the future good, the, the, uh, the consumer good at the very end. Okay, so what's the point of all this? How is this gonna tie in? Well, it means that production and entrepreneurship, the decisions that entrepreneurs make is interest rate sensitive or it's, uh, or actually probably a better way of saying is that this is, a, this is the primary time market. So this is where entrepreneurs are making their intertemporal decisions. They're, deciding to forego present consumption so that they can purchase these factors of production in anticipation of selling some uh, product at a profit and, and reap the difference, so they get the, the difference. So speaking of time preference, uh, we'll, we'll need to get a quick conception of loan markets before we proceed. So although production is the, is the main time market that pervades the entire economy, we can see a subsidiary or secondary time market in the form of, of people trading present and future money, so, or present money for the promise of future payments. So uh, we have uh, the law of time preference, which is that we prefer a given satisfaction sooner as opposed to later. As uh, Professor Herbener said, we like to shorten the period of production, all else held equal. And, and even though we, we are all subject to this law, like we all have this preference for the, the present over the future, we, we have this preference to varying degrees. So we prefer the, the present to different degrees than other people. And so here I have an example of David and Jeff. Uh, they have, these are preference rankings that they have for different amounts of money. The F stands for future and the P stands for present. And in this case, uh, David uh, can give a promise to Jeff, say, I'll give you $110, excuse me, 100, 
excuse me, $1,100 in the future in exchange for $1,000 in the present. And so they agree to this. And what emerges as a result is, is this uh, loan rate, this uh, price between the, the borrower and the lender. So we have a, a su supply of loans here and a demand for loans. And we get a market clearing interest rate. We get a certain quantity of loans that are transacted. Importantly, uh, one important element of this, one um, uh, part of the demand for loans is going to be entrepreneurs who have these different ideas of uh, production projects that they could embark on uh, to, in, to uh, provide consumer goods. So you can imagine that there are producers who, who want to start this, uh, this line of production, but they can't because they don't have all the capital. They don't have all of the, the money that they need now to start the production project, and so they can borrow. And so suppose they anticipate that by producing uh, some by producing a ham sandwich, they would have a 10% return, and they see on loan markets that people are willing to, to give these uh, business loans for at, at uh, 5%. And so the, the person could say, well, I, there's a chance for me to borrow. I think I said that. No, I said that right. So I could borrow at uh, 5% and then combine these factors to produce a ham sandwich, sell it, and I get, although I had to pay down the loan, I had to pay the 5%, I anticipate getting the 10%, and so I get the, the spread. I get the, that 5% difference. So on that demand curve there, we can imagine that, that there are a businesses, there are entrepreneurs who want to acquire the funds so that they can purchase factors of production. So as we've seen, there's, uh, there's good intertemporal coordination in the market. And... Uh, so we notice that entrepreneurs' plans are limited by real saving. So in order for that entrepreneur to acquire that loan, somebody has to be willing to part with the money in the first place. And by parting with the money, they're parting with the ability to spend the money on consumption goods, for example. So when, when the, the saver slash lender has, has decided, I'm not going to consume today, they are making available funds and resources for the entrepreneur to, to pursue uh, different production projects. So just like a Caruso is limited by his own stock of saved resources, entrepreneurs in the market economy are also constrained. They're constrained by the set of resources that have been set aside by, by people's own saving and uh, consumption decisions. The only projects that are deemed profitable are the ones in which the discounted revenues exceed the cost of production. So <clears throat> entrepreneurs have to make this, they have to do this calculation. They have to compare the, the factors and the, and the product, the consumer good that they'll produce, and not only that, but the revenue that they will achieve by producing that, that consumer good. But then since there's this time separation, they have to discount it. And so they're going to discount it by the interest rate. So the, the social rate of time preference that emerges in the market, they will use that as, as an aid in their calculation of deciding, well, um, I'm, I'm going to discount this factor good by, by, that, by that same amount so that I can um, appropriately align and spend the right amount on, on the factors of production. So they'll only do that if, uh, if those discounted revenues exceed the cost of production. So you can start to see how what might happen if that discount changes from, from some other source. Entre entrepreneurs do not undertake projects that would take too long. And, and the too long would mean that there are insufficient resources to complete them or there are more urgently desired projects. And uh, one other point here is that the, the rate of interest tends to be uniform between different lines of production. Uh, and this, you can see this, uh, it's pretty clear, it's obvious, because if there were some uh, excessive rate of return in one line of production, then entrepreneurs would flock to that. They would bid up the prices of the factors in that line where there are higher rates of return, and in so doing, diminish the revenues. So costs and revenues would, would come closer together in that higher rate of return line. And in so doing, they would actually cause the rate of return in the lines of production they left to increase. So because of this, the interest rate between the different lines of production and uh, between production and credit markets will tend to, to equalize uh, because of this. So what's the, uh, what's the, uh, the coup de grace here? What, what do we get as a result of this? What do we get as a result of the intertemporal coordination here? Well, because saving, an increase in saving, 
frees up resources for production, uh, it means that we can increase our production. It means that we can produce more. And uh, this happens through the work of credit markets. Saved funds are made available to entrepreneurs to purchase additional factors of production. And the entrepreneurs see the increased availability of funds, and they are able to take that and appropriately purchase re additional resources since the act of saving meant a foregoing of, of consumption. So there, now there actually are more resources available for production. And entrepreneurs can take that and they can start the new and longer lines of production. They can, it's uh, one reason why it would be longer is because they're gonna be creating new capital goods. So in the case of uh, Crusoe, uh, an additional stock of, of consumption goods would allow him to produce new capital goods that he, he, that would allow him to increase his productivity later. So he, he over the course of time saves up uh, enough coconuts and berries to last him through the number of days it would take him to, to make a fishing net. And so this is an, a lengthening of the structure of production because he now has to, it's more roundabout, he has to make the capital good first and then he can use the net for uh, production for fishing. So those new longer lines of production are started. And importantly, this is in line with consumers' time preferences. The additional investment uh, can go toward increased productivity. And this is uh, in excess of what's required for uh, just maintaining or replacing the existing capital stock. And uh, this gives us an expanded set of resources. That is, we have economic growth. So this is the Austrian theory of, of economic growth. Where does economic growth come from? Well, you have to save first, invest in production, create new capital goods. Um, you have to first set aside the resources to do so, and then you have increased productivity. And that increased productivity in the future can go towards additional consumption and additional production. So product productivity, in a sense, begets more productivity, or at least the opportunity uh, to be more productive. It's a nice story, right? But uh, what happens when, when things go wrong? <laughs> What happens when we have uh, the government sticking its finger into the workings of the market economy? What happens when we have a central bank that's expanding the money supply? Or, very importantly, uh, from Mises' original uh, telling of the, the business cycle story, what happens when, through the operations of fractional reserve banks, we have an increase in the supply of credit beyond real savings? So this, this is what we call an artificial credit expansion. It's artificial because it doesn't originate from a change in, in social time preferences. It doesn't originate from consumers deciding to save more. So nobody has decided that they're going to part with present consumption and, and set aside resources. What happens is they just, they just have this increase in the supply of loanable funds, the increase in credit that is not associated with people deciding to, to save more. So that's why we call it artificial. It's, it's like fake savings, fake uh, credit. So new money, newly created money, enters the economy through credit markets, and uh, this can happen, as uh, Dr. Patrick Newman noted, this can happen through the central bank's open market operations, and then through the, the extra pyramiding with the uh, fractional reserve banks. And it can also just occur within the fractional reserve banking system, independent of any action by the central bank. So the new money enters the economy through credit markets and represents an increased supply of loanable funds. So very important, this, this is a, a, a special application of Cantillon effects, which have been mentioned this week. So Cantillon effects refer to the, the unevenness of an increase in the money supply, how relative prices change, and it depends on where the new money originates. Where does it enter the economy? And so since the money is entering the economy through credit markets, it means that it's going to have distortive effects. It means that there are going to be changes in relative prices. There are going to be all sorts of changes as the money ripples away from the, from the, uh, the origin, from the, the, part, the, yeah, the part of the economy where it enters. So the interest rate falls. So this, is, this represents an increase in the supply of loanable funds. But once again, it's, re it's important to remember that it's an increase in the supply of loanable funds that's not based on a real increase in savings. So this is not people deciding to save more. This is an increase in the supply of loanable funds that's just based on the whims of central bankers or a change in the operations of, of banks. So the interest rate falls. Uh, it's not change in, a, in time preference. 
And at the lower interest rate, saving actually decreases. So at the lower interest rate, it's, uh, it's, it encourages people to go out and spend more on, on consumption goods. Consumption and borrowing increase. Firms take the new funds and invest in new longer lines of production. So entrepreneurs respond as if, as if the increased supply of loanable funds is real, as if it's based on real savings. So from their perspective, they see the, the, the new funds available in credit markets, they see the lower interest rate, and they respond as if there had been this increase in savings like we saw in the sustainable growth uh, slide. So, but this is not sustainable. This is not something that can persist. Entrepreneurs take, take the money and they use it to, to bid up the prices of factors of production and, and also change which lines of production they choose. So despite the, this language that I'm using of dislocations and things are off, this actually feels great. And in fact, if you ask any journalist, they would say that the economy is booming. We're doing great. Wages are increasing, employment increases, consumption increases, investment spending increases, stock prices are up, incomes are up. It's, it's a general boom and everybody's happy. <clears throat> Unfortunately, during, during this boom phase, the consumption and investment that, that's happening is counter to what would have happened in the unhampered market. It, it's, uh, it's different, and it's in a way that actually hampers our, our future uh, growth potential. So two things in general happen. We have overconsumption and malinvestment. Overconsumption happens when uh, new profits and incomes and the higher net worth calculations of, of indi individuals uh, encourage increased consumption. So people see that their wages are up, their incomes are up. They also see the lower interest rate, and they see the borrowing is for consumer credit is easier. And so there's an increase in consumption. And so real consumption increases during the boom. Resources move from early to late stages uh, due to the increased consumption. So we have uh, capital consumption. This is not overinvestment. What we actually have is overconsumption, not overinvestment. I'm citing uh, uh, Professor Salerno's great article, A Reformulation of Austrian Business Cycle Theory in Light of the Financial Crisis, uh, published in 2012. In, in that article, it's, uh, it's great because he, he really does single out and emphasize the importance of the overconsumption aspect of the boom. During the boom, we also have malinvestment. So uh, malinvestment is when resources are misallocated due to inflation and falsified interest rates. Very importantly, specific capital goods, meaning capital goods that are uh, intended and designed to go along with particular lines of production and aren't as applicable in other lines of production are created for, the, for those new lines that are chosen. So it's not, it's not the case where we just, we just create too much capital. It's, it's not the case where we just uh, we spin out capital goods that are helpful for us in, in producing, but, but then when the bust comes, we just got to quickly move them over to different lines of production. The fact that specific capital goods are, are created during the boom means that there's going to be some pain. It means that there's going to be some, some struggle in finding new productive and profitable ways to use those capital goods. And here, you'll, if you remember at the beginning, when we were listing out the things that we had to explain with our business cycle theory, here, this is uh, one reason why we have more dramatic fluctuations in capital goods industries as opposed to consumer goods industries. It's because labor is relatively nonspecific. So you can, you can move, I mean, there is some specificity with labor, as, uh, especially as skills are learned, but humans are you know, relatively shaped similar, right? And we can all press buttons, we can all you know, pick things up, that sort of thing. And so in terms of the way labor is applied in production, it's, it's much less specific compared to the capital goods that we build. So think about like a hammer. A hammer is really only good at one sort of action, one sort of thing. But, but human beings in our, the effort that we apply in production is generally applicable. Okay, so we have malinvestment. The credit expansion does not represent an increase in real resources. We can't, we can't fake our way, we can't inflate our way to, to making it feel like we have more stuff. Not an increase in real resources, so factors of production become increasingly scarce. The, once the uh, errors are realized, and usually the way this happens is uh, the price inflation that happens as a result of the increase in money 
uh, is politically unpopular, pressures the Fed to, to cause interest rates to come up or allow interest rates to come up is a better way to say it. And, and this causes everybody to, you know, say, to, to pause what they're doing and reevaluate the production projects that they've started and reevaluate the profitability and, and productivity of everything that they're doing. So the, the profits, what they expected to be profits, turn into realized losses as now they, now they don't have this stream of funds coming from either the banking system or the central bank to, to keep the, the bad projects, the malinvestments alive. So projects are abandoned, and that's what happens during the bust. So here in uh, this case, I've got uh, Ludwig the Builder over here. He's realized that he's run out of resources, and he's just sort of sitting. He's looking at his blueprints, and they haven't completed the house. Notice the size of the house. That'll become important in, on the next slide. But during the bust, firms liquidate malinde malinvested capital. So they, they have to sell the assets that they have for the price that they can get. Uh, and much of the time, it's for a much lower price than they would like. So wages decrease as, as uh, the demand for labor decreases. Workers are laid off. But due to the relative non-specificity of labor, wages don't fall as much as capital goods. So like I said, the, sp the specificity of capital goods explains that feature of the, the boom-bust cycle. So notice here, uh, Ludwig, the builder, has decided to uh, rearrange the goods that he has, rearrange the resources that he does have. He has to dismantle what he put together, but he comes up with a new plan and builds a smaller house. And this is what happens during the healthy correction phase. This is what happens during the recession. So during the bust, during the recession, prices readjust to reflect consumer demands. Interest rates go back to what the, the market would have by their um, time preferences. And it, it's very important to remember that the bust is a correction phase as people try to find profitable uses for factors of production. It's this, this is a very common error uh, that we see broadly, uh, especially among politicians, that the recession is something that has to be fixed. The recession is something that has to be inhibited, that we have to, we have to keep all the economic activity that existed during the boom afloat. We have to keep it alive with more credit expansion, with more government spending. But if you have a proper view of what's happening during the bust, which is we're fixing the mistakes that were made in the past, then you realize, well, this is, this is a healthy, it, painful, but still healthy process for us to, to, to go through. And anything that we do to try to inhibit that or, or say the recession is a bad thing that needs to be fixed means that we're gonna inhibit that healthy correction. Okay, so let's contrast this theory to other theories very quickly. In the, in the Keynesian view, the bust comes from nowhere. There's this automatic, there's, there's all of the sudden uh, collapse in investment spending that's viewed as very unstable. And because the total amount of spending uh, is correlated with the full employment of resources, it means that if we have this collapse in spending, uh, this collapse in aggregate demand, it means that now uh, we don't have the, the right amount of spending to employ all the resources. So we get these idle resources. And one reason why we have the idle resources is that prices don't change. So we have so-called sticky wages. Um, we have prices not adjusting to the change in, in total spending. And so the only hope, since this is something that's inherent to the market economy, it's just inherent to, the, to investment spending, our only hope is is government. So we have to have the government step in and increase this G. So I falls or C falls. And so we have to offset it with a big increase in G. Or alternatively, we could use the monetary authority. We could look to the central bank and say, please increase the money supply, lower interest rates so that now consumption and investment will get kick-started again. So now we can use monetary policy to generate the consumption and investment spending that uh, we've noticed has fallen. So their only hope is government. Only an institution outside the market can, can boost spending and demand back up to the point where we have full employment. You'll notice that the monetarists have a similar story, very similar. Uh, so that a lot of times they pretend that they're enemies, but when you look closely at the stories that they're telling, it's, it's very similar. So in the monetarist case, like if you listen to Milton Friedman talk about the Great Depression, there's this sudden decrease in M's. Uh, there's a, like a banking crisis that causes a bunch of banks to fail, and so the money supply 
contracts. And due to sticky prices, sticky wages, we have underemployed resources or idle resources. And what we need to, to stabilize the economy, what we need to either stabilize prices or nominal expenditures, is we need the monetary authority to step in and increase in, prevent, prevent the money supply from collapsing so that we can stabilize these aspects of the economy. And depending on the monetarist you ask, they'll say either the, the price level or the inflation rate and nominal expenditures. So like I said, they're, they're telling very similar stories. Okay, so what are, what are the lessons learned here? One, one lesson is that if you look at highly aggregated data, you're going to misdiagnose the problem and you're going to give bad solutions. So one difference, as you saw between the Keynesian view and the Austrian view, is the way we understand production. So Austrians view production is happening in time. It's very complex. We make specific capital goods. Uh, so capital is heterogeneous. And so if you lump it all together in the form of I or in the form of the K and, and neoclassical production functions, it means that you're, you're missing out on the, uh, the essential problems. You're missing out on seeing what's actually happening during the artificial boom. And so you misdiagnose the problem. And then you also give bad solutions. So like in the case of the monetarists, their solution is an increase in the money supply. But as, as we know as Austrians, this actually just paves the way for another boom-bust cycle. This actually triggers uh, another boom-bust cycle or would at least delay the correction phase that, that's currently underway if, if that increase in the money supply happens during the bust. Or in the case of uh, Keynesians, you just say, well, there's less spending, therefore we need more spending. So, <laughs> so that's another misdiagnosis and bad solution. Another thing that we notice is that in order to, to understand what's going on, it's, it's good to see how the economy can work. So you have to first see, uh, you must first understand how things could ever go right before you can ask what might go wrong. I flipped the quote around accidentally, but you get the picture. So we looked at where sustainable growth comes from. It comes from real savings. It comes from the setting aside of real resources for production and lengthening production with, with more productive capital goods. So uh, sustainable production is based on a real reallocation of resources away from consumption. It comes from uh, real savings. And unsustainable booms are caused by artificial increases in credit. Recessions are the time when we fix the mistakes of the past. And I have just a, a couple minutes left here to, to review some uh, recommended reading. So this is an order of uh, maybe beginner to advanced. Uh, I, I say that, but I mean, Meltdown is a, is a great book, it, even like a, a – a, uh, advanced scholars, a PhD should or could read Meltdown and gain from it. So Meltdown by Tom Woods was one of the first books that I ever read. I think I read it after Economics in One Lesson. Uh, not one of the first books I ever read, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, C-Spot Run, hey, here's Meltdown, yeah. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a great introduction to business cycle theory, and he applies it to the Great Recession and financial crisis that we saw in 2008. Um, a lot of this presentation is based on Rothbard's presentation of business cycles in America's Great Depression. To this day, I think that's the, the best, clearest, simplest exposition of business cycle theory. Uh, so you should definitely uh, check out chapter one. And then after you read chapter one, read the rest of the book as well. Uh, Mises has uh, the causes of the economic crisis. I, I mentioned uh, Salerno's article, The Reformulation of Austrian Business Cycle Theory. Uh, Dr. R uh, Roger Garrison has a famous book called Time and Money, which I think was recommended by a previous presenter. And here he has a graphical exposition. So he, he uses the production possibilities frontier and the loanable funds market and the structure of production all working together. And it's uh, pedagogically, it's, it's beautiful. It's, uh, you see the, all the graphs working together. And uh, it was actually his presentation of this that uh, first interested me in studying economics. So it was actually upstairs uh, where he presented that. And then uh, finally, uh, for advanced readers, I would, I would definitely recommend seeing uh, Mises's original presentation of business cycle theory in the theory of money and credit. So thank you very much.